We're going to get started now. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Smith, and I'm the University Librarian and Vice Provost for Digital Scholarship here at UC Davis. So we're your host tonight. And this is the first time that the library has hosted this event, which is in its uh, fourth or fifth of the year um, and is being done every month, really, from now until the end of this uh, academic year. And we're really happy to be hosting this in the library because, A, there are a lot of students already here, so it's very easy for you to come and participate in these really interesting events. And B, because it's part of our mission to make sure that we're helping students be successful. And I think this series is really important in the way that it's framing the question of how you shape a career and how you learn about industries and the future of employment in lots of different industries that are really going to be shaping our country and our world in the future. So we're super excited to be hosting this series and um, very grateful to the Morris twins who are really the brains behind this organization, this whole effort, and uh, have put together this program for you tonight and all the future ones, which I'm sure they will tell you about today. Uh, so with that, thank you all for coming. I hope you ate all the food and I will let Julia explain what is going on. All right, hello, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this series, it's relatively new, uh, the goal of the Future of Work series is to get students to think more critically about the science and technology driven problem spaces that are going to demand extra attention in the coming years and to encourage you all to explore how these problems can be turned into opportunities that can transform your career paths. So for each talk, we'll pair one UC Davis faculty member or administrator with one professional from industry, nonprofit, government, uh, startups, have both groups interview each other, and then answer the same questions from different perspectives. So as the series progresses, we plan to explore things like data, AI, robotics, clean tech, biotech, media, governance, you get the drift. Ultimately, we want to embolden you all to look beyond job titles and think more adventurously when it comes to what kinds of problems you want to solve, be that through working in entirely new industries or helping transform and modernize existing ones. Before we begin, I'd like to very quickly acknowledge some of the people who have made today's event possible. First, thank you to our team of undergraduates, Pamela, Emily, Kai, Jessica, Vivian, and of course, my sister, Livia. This series is currently co-sponsored by the Office of the Provost and the UC Davis Library. And there are many different individuals who are now involved in bringing this series to life. Our advisory board comprised of Beth Broom, Mackenzie Smith, Martin Kenny, Mark Fasciotti, Himant Bargava, Colin Milburn, and Dan Flynn has been instrumental in shaping this series. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Beth Callahan, Debbie Snap, Jessica Nussbaum, Bill Garrity and Lorella Gino, and everyone else at the UC Davis Library who has supported us throughout our partnership. Which brings us to our event today. Mark Nitzberg is an AI scientist, entrepreneur, and consultant to industry and government. He is the executive director of the, of the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley, head of strategic outreach for the Berkeley AI Research Lab, and a principal at the Cambrian AI Think Tank Network. He served as a principal at ViaWeb, which built the world's first e-commerce platform. And most recently, he was the director of computer vision products at Amazon A9 following their acquisition of the Blindsight Corporation, the maker of assistive technologies for low vision and active aging, where he was the founding CEO. He is the co-author of the book Solomon's Code, Humanity in a World of Thinking Machines. He began studying AI as a stowaway student at MIT in the AI wave of the early 1980s and went on to complete his PhD in computer vision and human perception at Harvard. Montabar Gava is an expert in technology management and the information technology industry. He also studies the use of IT in clinical healthcare and has previously worked on data-driven and analytical decision-making in organizations. He earned his PhD in information systems operations and economics from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And he currently serves as Jerome and Elsie Cern Chair in Technology Management. He was also the founding director of the MSBA program at the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. He is currently in the process of creating the Center for X Transformation at UC Davis. After our speakers have finished their 45 minute long fireside chat, 
going to move into a q and A. It's powered by anonymous polling, and we encourage you to submit your questions real time as you learn from our speakers. So, with all that said, please give a warm welcome to Professor Hemant Bargava and Professor Mark Nitzberg. All right, Mark, so where do we begin? Let's talk about artificial intelligence. All right. Or sophisticated mimicry. Okay, yeah. So um, we thought it would be interesting to get a sense of the audience. And um, just through a very, very quick show of hands, um, how many of the students here in particular are from the tech side of campus, which would be computing, math, uh, engineering, and so forth? Can you just have a quick show? All right. Okay. And uh, you want to take the, what would the other half be like, Mark? Well, uh, how many of you are um, worried about that half um, <laughs> doing something that would limit your lives or make them make it make things worse? Right? Okay. Uh, you know, healthy skepticism, right? So we thought it might be interesting to begin, you know, right at the uh, bottom with uh, giving you a quick sense of what is AI, because it has gone through so much change in the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, I think Mark and I both were fortunate to have begun our professional careers at, I don't know, would you describe that as like the stone age of AI or medieval age of AI? And so maybe do you want to kick us off with uh, what AI is or has been, and then we take it from there. Artificial intelligence is a great term. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's so evocative, and, and we tend to anthropomorphize as it is, um, but uh, 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 back when it was, it was first imagined that you could give a machine instructions, and, and those instructions would teach it to do what we do, uh, uh, you know, it's captured the imagination. And uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the only problem is that, that when it started, uh, you, you, you know, it was a very rudimentary machine uh, that, that required uh, a lot of attendance uh, feeding it. And so uh, uh, the, the, the um, bar for what constituted artificial intelligence was uh, was, was set rather low, and then uh, it just kept moving. So artificial intelligence was defined as whatever you couldn't do at the time. Uh, and, and I think the early, uh, uh, the early bar was uh, if it could play chess, uh, and then uh, it moved from there. And, and uh, at this point, um, it, it's now become uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, the term is used in, in several different ways in, uh, you know, in Hollywood and in common parlance at parties and so forth. Uh, it, it really means artificial general intelligence, that, that term of art uh, that refers to uh, uh, the, the ability of a machine to perform any uh, cognitive task at a human level. And, uh, uh, and, and more than that, uh, that uh, uh, a machine will open its eyes and, and, and be conscious. Um, and so that's, that's a, uh, uh, something that I'd like to impress upon you, is that that's uh, uh, really not uh, uh, around the corner. Uh, if you stop any of the professors at the, at the AI lab at Berkeley and say, I've got a billion dollars, can you make me consciousness, uh, uh, they'll say no, right? I can't do that, uh, not during my lifetime. And, and uh, so, so there's another uh, way in which the, the term is used. Artificial intelligence is, is uh, 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 a, a, you know, thanks to recent breakthroughs, a, an application of machine learning to uh, generally to large amounts of data, um, and that is, is, I think, where we get the, the, the concept of mimicry. Um, it, uh, uh, it you know, enables um, uh, a, a, 
kind of automated and amplified version of something that we do, and it gives the appearance of human behavior. Um, and and that, that's, uh, you know, today's artificial intelligence uh, can be easily confused for um, uh, uh, consciousness uh, if you don't really know what you're, you know, what, what you're seeing. But it's, it's much more superficial. It's really statistical inference. So one of the points I would like to <clears throat> mention or maybe impress is the, the, the AI, of course, cannot be separated from computation or automation more generally, right? And as we talk about uh, you know, other issues that we should discuss today, future of work uh, and ethics and business of uh, AI, it's, it's really intertwined with the business or ethics or work impacts of automation in general. And I think for many of you, it might be really useful to keep in mind that even these uh, devices we have in our hands today hold computation power, which is, if you think of the days when AI work started back around you know, 50, 60 years ago, this much computation power was not available to any of the AI researchers, or either com computing power or the amount of data, of course, uh, that we're talking about. And, and so the, the goals of AI have really changed so much from this you know, emulated, being like human, intelligent humans to um, producing outcomes that look like they might have come from humans. But also the methods of AI have changed so much from trying to teach machines intelligent things and logic in particular, and how to reason with uncertainty or how to reason with time uh, you know, those sorts of very general reasoning sorts of concepts to really letting machines uh, learn from massive amounts of data. And so this whole wave of transformation in AI has been accompanied by the fact that we have massive computational power at our disposal. Uh, we've learned how to use that massive computation power smartly through parallel computation, right? And then, of course, this whole thing about big data that... Uh, that learning can occur if you teach, give a, give a machine lots and lots of examples. And those examples are now available to us in digital form, so you can feed them to the machine uh, very, very, very quickly. So the goals have changed, the methods have changed, the scale of AI has really increased so vastly. Um, and so it's, it's computation and automation, but then also there's analytics. Our ability to use, you know, build algorithms that are extremely powerful. So in particular, when we talk about AI and machine learning, there is this whole transition from, you know, thinking of uh, doing AI through sort of mimicking what happens in the brain with neural networks, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of multi-layer neural networks has ex existed for a really long time, but it was hard to uh, optimize. The, the parameters that go into uh, these networks. And, and that's what we've been seeing in the last 10 years of uh, you know, progress in deep learning. So one of the things um, you know, I find very interesting is as we look at where, you know, how AI is going to imp impact our society, workplace, business, and so forth, one of the things um, I find interesting and we mentioned very briefly was whether, you know, if you look at these 50 or 60 years of AI where it has been through ups and downs and had a few major breakthroughs, are we looking at the next 20 years of AI producing major scientific breakthroughs in machine learning, computation, and so forth? Or are we at an age where we've got a very general purpose tool through, you know, the all earlier progress in deep learning? that really the time is now to say how we can take these concepts of deep learning and you know, combine them with big data and algorithms <laughs> to then produce AI applications in just one area after another. What do you think about that, Mark? Well, there's certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, a variety of, of opinions. Um, the, the, the uh, the venture capitalist Kai Fu Lee wrote a book about uh, uh, the, this, this, this shift from the era of research to the era of applications in AI. Um, and his, his, his book uh, uh, underscores that the research uh, era is over, and that was mostly done in the United States, and mm -hmm. that the era of application is now in China, 
and and uh, that that uh, that's why the book is called AI Superpowers, and it, and it makes very nice point counterpoint uh, discussion. Um, but I, I think it, it's uh, it, 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 it's a bit um, uh, more nuanced. We we have made you know we've seen a breakthrough uh, with deep networks, and uh, that's given us uh, you know essentially. Uh, un, unparalleled uh, uh, image recognition, um, speech recognition, and uh, um, the, the ability to uh, uh, predict what you're likely to buy next, and so forth. Um, uh, but in order to, uh, to, to move to the next level of, of um, intelligence, uh, we need further breakthroughs. Um, you know, systems are at this point not actually understanding uh, when when you speak, they're transcribing, and then uh, they, 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 you know they, they might have uh, uh, the ability to to answer a question, but um, understanding what a sensible question would be under the circumstances and this kind of thing uh, is is beyond it. Yeah, but if you take that point about that you made about general AI or artificial general intelligence versus applying AI in narrow context, how much does it matter if a machine understood the sentence truly or you know, knew how to ask sensible questions, if it could actually produce sensible answers in new contexts and, and, keep, and be able to keep doing that in new and new ways because it keeps getting fed more examples, more data through which it can learn how to do things. Um, it's a good point. Uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the experiment in the, in the early 60s by Joseph Weizenbaum of making a, uh, a, a sort of um, uh, psychologist program, it's a very mm -hmm. short program, you can now run it in your browser. Are you referring to ELISA? Yeah, ELISA, yeah. right, yeah. It, it, you know, was, was convincing to, to people and then they wanted to spend a long time talking to it, and they would send him out and say, I'm still talking to her. And, and that was a long time ago. So, so you can give the appearance, the superficial appearance of, of, this, uh, of this understanding and get quite far. Yeah, so one example is, um, for instance, conversation in service automation at customer service, where normally when you make a phone call to a customer service agent, you're talking to a human being in, could be India or Indonesia or somewhere. But today we are at a point where many of those calls are being handled by uh, bots. Mm -hmm. And especially if your customer service interaction is occurring through text rather than voice, there is an incredible role for chat bots. And in that case, I think many of us probably have, in, and we do this with voice recognition systems all the time, where we interact with computers and we don't quite know that we're talking to a machine. So, I think it's getting back to this point that with, with massive amounts of data and huge amounts of computing power, that machines are able to compute tasks, uh, you know, all the way from these. So if, if you define what is intelligence, right? There, people thought natural language, speech mm. is intelligent. Um, you know, many of you might think that solving a system of million equations is intelligent. Most people would not be able to do that, right? So if we deploy computing power with the right kind of algorithmic machinery, and, and that's where AI gets really interesting today, right? When mm. we think of an algorithm as being a set of steps to perform a certain task, right? And, and ideally, we should be able to trace back a result coming out of a computer system to how was it built, how was it coded? And and nowadays with machine learning, when we feed a machine a lot of examples and produce certain answers, we cannot quite trace or understand where those answers came from. And yet, it satisfies that definition of producing outcomes that look like they came from a human or sort of that Turing mm -hmm. test of, I'm talking to a customer service agent and I don't quite know whether I'm talking to a machine or a real person. There are a couple of things uh, that, that uh, this makes me think. First of all, there, there's a law um, in California, and, and this is the first place that this, this kind of law has been enacted, 
that uh, if you are a bot uh, and you are trying to sell something or uh, uh, promote something political, then you must declare that you're not a person um, uh, on pain of I don't know what. So it's, it's a question of whether that's enforceable. But I think that that, uh, that, that makes a point. That they, Is that, they, that's not part of the recent privacy regulation. No, that, that, actually, that yeah. actually was enacted last year in July. And, uh, and so bots must declare that they're bots if they're trying to sell you something. And, um, uh, and, and I think that's, it, it's a good concept. Mm -hmm. And we'll see whether it can be enforced. But I, I thought that was very interesting. But uh, there is a, a certain uh, a limit to what you can do with uh, the, this, this you know, imitation um, kind of technology. So uh, uh, by way of example, if you are a translator, um, the, the things that you translate generally uh, refer down to a an, an human experience. So you read something in, in one language, and then it is grounded in some human experience, and then you express it in the other language. And in the case of a translation engine these days, it's, it's statistical. And so it really is uh, a fantastically uh, uh, useful um, uh, matching system. And it matches phrase for phrase. And it gives you the best phrase under the circumstances, in the context, given the, you know, the statistical collection of words that appeared before and, and perhaps after, and that was an important intuition. But uh, I I again, it gets to context uh, outside of the words and, and into the, the human experience that that's missing. And we talk about breakthroughs, and one of the necessary breakthroughs is to, to capture uh, the, the, the physics of the world mm -hmm. and, and the way people interact and the likely you know, uh, uh, situations and so forth. Um, so, so we're we're uh, we, we do want to understand uh, uh, when a machine is is uh, giving a, a good you know imitation, um, but we should also uh, understand that it uh, does not know the purpose of an mm -hmm. object when it recognizes it. That's a chair, but it doesn't know what it's for or how it's generally used. And that's uh, that's you know that's another step. Mm. So two things you two words you mentioned past experiences and statistical. I'd love to pick them up on because especially in today's AI, which again based so much on learning from uh, data, that what you feed the machine in is obviously going to bias its learning and its mm. outcomes in in various ways. And in particular, if I think of, uh, you know, I mean, there have been so many experiments of feeding machines, the whole Lexus Nexus database, for instance, or, you know, various corpuses of books and other materials. And in particular, if you look at any society, and let's take the US, uh, if you think of the content, the knowledge that is, or examples that are being given to these natural language uh, or other systems, you know, we are a country where, um, um, for instance, if you think of equality, right? There are so many groups that were not considered equal until 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. If you think of the right for women to vote, mm -hmm. or the right for um, non-land owners to vote, or you know these decisions based on race. So, so much of the content that is being fed to these learning systems, what happens? Um, to the ability of the machine to produce results that are contemporary to our life today when it's learning from uh, a lot of data that uh, you know, is re not representative of, of the values we have now? So it, it, the, the great uh, uh, metaphor that I use is just an amplifier. So mm -hmm. The machine is, is a very sophisticated amplifier. It will take care of the, the, the task at hand uh, for example, determining whether uh, this particular inmate should be sprung from jail or uh, you know, whether someone is, is performing the duties of their job well um, uh, and, and follow the same steps that, that the last 30 people in that job were following mm -hmm. and it will include all of their you know, worst uh, biases, right? And so it actually, just I, that, it and that, multiplies that it by brings 10, to my mind uh, what happened at Facebook over the last four years. I think 
around four years ago, they were accused of having a left-leaning liberal bias because some people on the team were pushing mm -hmm. their human curators to, uh, you know, the goal was to, pr to, to promote news items that were popular, right? And that, that itself, there's a herd effect there when you go after popularity and keep, keep pushing that. But they had a little bit of bias there and were called out on that and decided to make uh, curation more automated. And that led to this whole fiasco of fake news that became popular. Mm. And because it was now algorithmic, it got just amplified, mm. you know, the term that you used enormously. So, so I think that's another issue when we start thinking about what kinds of work AI machines can do um, versus humans. I know you have had experience in your work at the government level and other places working on these issues. I'd love to hear your perspective on how, how we bring some level of ethics and a reflection of our values. And in particular, I think I would draw a contrast between AI work that happens in the government. And you know, we were talking about, for instance, military applications of AI, where there might be very sophisticated machines uh, and drones that have enormous autonomy and intelligence in route finding and chasing certain targets. And yet, there is both a human in the loop in making the final decision. And moreover, even to the extent that when there is not a human in the loop, the decisions of the machine are programmed under certain policy and, and a legal framework. And then you have the other sector of private uh, AI-based products and enterprises, where it's really not clear to me that that kind of framework is being followed. And in particular, you know, I think at the start, we asked people who have technical backgrounds and non-technical backgrounds. And very often in businesses, it might be the case that there is a programming team that is handed the task of producing some intelligent software to replace you know, how, what products or promotions are given to customers or what, you know, how, uh, uh, a profiling machine might work at an airport and sift people through on one side or the other. And very often these ethical choices are made at the lowest level by programmers because that question was never recognized higher up in the institution. So what, what, what framework or what hope do we have that as more and more AI deployments occur, right? that uh, we don't run into the Facebook uh, fake news fiascos and other things of that sort that can be very detrimental. We, we talk about, um, you know, there have been for at least uh, three years a, a lot of, uh, of meetings convened by organizations with, uh, with uh, concern, and mm -hmm. we, we refer to this as hand-wringing. We're worried, uh, and then uh, the results of those meetings were generally principles, principles by which uh, AI should be developed and deployed and tested and, and governed. And so there are at least 40 sets of principles that came up uh, all over the world. And uh, you can look them up and, and you know, look at the Solomar principles um, from the Future of Life Institute and the, the IEEE uh, uh, principles of, of ethical design. And, uh, and they're all um, uh, a good start. Um, but they, they all, to me, they all amount to different ways in which uh, we should aim to, to, you know, on the side of virtue and, and avoid, uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, the, 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 the harsher side. But these, these are starting to be transformed now and translated into policy. And so there's a, uh, uh, the general data uh, protection regulation that uh, came out uh, a year mm -hmm. and some ago in Europe and then ours in California uh, the the uh, California Consumer Privacy Code uh, that that uh, just is is now one month old and and probably the reason that you're seeing a lot of of, of uh, uh, banners at the bottom of whenever you go to a website and it says would you like uh, would you like us to continue selling your data or would you rather opt out mm -hmm. and uh, so know, if I may interrupt you on the principal yeah. issue right we brought up the the thing that you mentioned earlier about uh, much of the work now moving you know. We, AI work being uh, moving from being very US centric to certainly China being one of the leading countries yeah. where AI work is done. And I want to connect it to this point about development of principles. 
and to what extent principles developed in certain areas might equally apply elsewhere. I think, um, so to give, sort of give a couple of examples, one if we look just at numbers, I think if, uh, for last year's investments in AI, over 50% is happening in China, with the US at around 40% of investments. And in the, you know, and I study technologies and platforms, and in the last 15 years of you know, internet-based uh, companies, if you look at the major platforms that have been built in the US, uh, Google, Search, uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, various other things, in almost every case, there has been a Chinese imitator down to the level of copying colors, page designs, even logos, right? And there's a really fascinating story about uh, the Facebook equivalent in China, which many of you here may recognize. I don't know how many of you know about Ren Ren and Kai Shun. And that's really interesting because Ren Ren was a Facebook copy, which then got copied by um, Question. And uh, unfortunately, the company that developed that uh, had to put, pick a domain name of Kaishin001 because Kaishin wasn't available. <laughs> and then Renren Ren came in and developed, uh, bought over Kaishin. So it's, it's like copying hmm. identical product design and logos apparently was not a violation of principles or ethics. And more recently, we've seen like work in stem cell research and other areas where actions have been taken that do not seem to conform to the similar ethical principles. So how do we get, uh, you know, we can certainly have countries and maybe even groups of countries developing these principles, but if they're not going to be followed identically in a cutthroat competitive business world, then that leads to issues where uh, you, know, you may have uh, these sorts of outcomes. And another thing, coming back to the investments in AI that I find interesting or worrying is not just how machines may resolve ethical dilemmas, which you know, people talk about famous examples of a car, autonomous car driving down the street, and will it let you die, or will it kill five other pedestrians to save you, right? Those sorts of things. But also, what do, we, what do we choose to do? What AI machines do we choose to build? And I find it quite interesting that uh, you know, in the last year, 10% of investments in AI happen in autonomous cars, and only 5% in medical research. And is that business imperative? Is that, that it's easier to produce breakthroughs in one field versus another? Well, I mean, it doesn't seem, probably would not seem to agree uh, with most people's ethics that more money should go into autonomous cars, which will end up replacing human drivers versus in medical research that may produce uh, better outcomes. Better and I'm trying to relate this back to, to work and, and jobs. Right? One is going to eliminate some jobs, and the other may actually ha has the potential to uh, bring more jobs and improve outcomes. Just to take a... a um, hypothetical, oh, uh, hypothetical, uh, uh, you, you know, alternative mm -hmm. view. Um, there's there's a, a a sense in which one could say the market forces are driving the investments in mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles. There, there's a market, and there are investors. The investors want to uh, to, to to multiply their holdings and create value, and so, uh, and then they look at the the you know, likely uh, uh, what, what they're optimizing for is, uh, you know, uh, 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 shareholder value. And so it's better to put it in uh, cars than, than, uh, than in healthcare. Uh, and, and that would, uh, that, you know, that speaks to the role of government in encouraging, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, encouraging us to, nudging us towards, uh, you know, away from our, 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 our worst instincts and towards our better instincts, and uh, uh, and so that um, th that that is you know the seed of the 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 role of of um, uh, uh, the, the directing you know directing investment at the, mm -hmm. at the research level. Yeah, and I think I'm glad you brought up Kai Fu Lee's book because of this discussion between U.S. versus China and what might happen and where might it happen because. In China, there is a policy for AI. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's a state policy for AI. Now, it may not be great or it may not be you know, 
maybe not be implemented exactly as it may be conceived or it may be impl implemented more for the benefit of the state rather than its people, right? But in the US where it's predominantly private and market-based forces, the danger is people chase, often these market level investments are inefficient because a number of companies are trying to build these autonomous cars because each of them thinks they might be the sole or the first company that builds it and can then create enormous competitive advantage, which is actually not likely to happen because if we do get autonomous cars, then for instance, if Uber has this dream of putting millions of autonomous cars on the market and therefore making a lot of profit, that actually will not happen because the price of an autonomously driven car uh, may be less than what it is today, a dollar per mile. It may fall down to 10 cents a mile. And therefore, it would have been really bad investments made by the market, right? I uh, don't have personal experience with the Central Committee in China, um, but, but reading their, mm -hmm. their, their plan, uh, it does look like there's thought put into it and, and determining where the, the resources will go. Um, and, uh, and I think that there was some thought uh, as to how the, the US should approach its investments in AI. Um, and uh, and the, the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, uh, had some studies mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in uh, um, I, I think, 2016, um, and then and it, it, it sort of died down for a while. Okay. We're, waiting, we're waiting for yeah. some more policy. Yeah. And I recall in the 1990s, the U when again there was some work in AI, the US was scared about Japan because you had the Ministry of Information Technology and Industry pushing AI as a major goal um, and trying to make Japan the superpower. And that obviously you know, did not happen and Japan has fallen way behind. So then we, we can be similar, similarly hopeful that innovation and application work in AI will continue to happen, you know, or that the US would have a lead in doing that because our methods and incentives and markets will still lead to good outcomes. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, pick a winner, but I, 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 would, I would say that I've seen some very uh, impressive uh, uh, advances in robotics coming out of China, and, um, and at the same time, uh, you know, being born and raised here, uh, it's hard to forget that the, you know, transistor and the integrated circuit and, the, you know, uh, personal computer and, and so much came out of mm -hmm. the United States. So, but, but it remains to be seen. All right. So I think we are getting that signal to uh, stop. So we'll quit at this point, but I'm sure we'll take questions from you all. So this brings us to the question and answer portion of the evening. If you haven't submitted questions yet but would like to, you can just go to slido.com and use the code on the screen, F-O-W-U-C-D. And if you don't want to ask a question but you see one and you wish that you would have asked it, you can hit the upvote button and it'll bring it closer to the top. So I will start at the very top. And that question is, as businesses continue to use algorithms to personalize content, is there a chance that this could negatively impact a user's thinking patterns or mental schema? Can I take that one? Sure. I, I have a very strong opinion about this uh, because the, 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 the answer to that is there is a 100% chance because it's already happened. Um, so so there's a there's a... A simple AI algorithm called adaptive reinforcement learning that, you know, is the 40 lines of code, and that is, uh, th that is used by, let's just say, Facebook to determine which out of the thousand posts that your hundred friends have put on since last night, 
which, uh, you know, three you're going to look at because you only have a few minutes, right? And, and the, 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 the choice is sold as uh, uh, a choice to, 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 to assure that you're seeing something that's interesting and important to you based on your past uh, behavior. Uh, it understands your interests and it's got your number and it gives you those, uh, those, those you know, most interesting things. But, but the fact is that you don't have a fixed set of preferences mm -hmm. and in, in presenting you with the things that you're most likely to click on, it starts to move you in a certain direction. And it turns out that that direction is the direction of extremes. And so that's where we have, as Stuart Russell likes to say, uh, grandma uh, becoming a rabid neo-fascist. Um, it starts off looking at the things she's interested in and it just gets a little more interesting to click on that next thing that's a little more extreme until we, we you know, and, and at a limit, uh, it's part of what is going on uh, that, that, um, uh, that I think is, is, you know, threatening to dismantle democracy as we know it. If I can just expand on that a little bit, you know, you talked about consciousness at the start, and I would twist that into free will. And how many of you here would think that um, you have free will more than a computer or an AI system, right? Humans have free will, right? But if you take what um, Mark just described, you know, I could be looking at a Facebook post, and of course, this algorithm is driving me in certain directions. I'm reading those posts not because I intended to, but it's really, I'm beginning to lose free will. And moreover, I may end up spending a lot more time than I, maybe I, I moved to the machine because there was a notification and I wanted to just read that one single item. And then through other things that are related to it, I get pushed to more and more. And then perhaps I get uh, directed, which happens to me a lot, I find a video on a, you know, tennis match from 2017, and I'll switch over to YouTube and watch 15 minutes of that, and that then YouTube begins taking over those recommendations. So we really wonder at what point have we as humans lost free will? Because I'm not spending my day or time or that hour the way I wanted to. And it's really being controlled by machines, somebody's algorithm, but ultimately it's being controlled by all the data that is driving learning systems. Before we have a funeral about free will, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's true uh, that um, when I was growing up, uh, there was a television and I would turn it on and it would be very interesting with people moving and, and, and you know, social situations and, and I wanted to see what would happen next and I watched a lot more television than I would have if there were no television. Um, and so in that sense, uh, I was giving up some free will. But when I turned 13, I remember I had a younger brother, and I gave my television to my younger brother. And, and that was my You brought your free will back. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. I will ask the question in the number two spot right now, just because I think it's so complementary to what you guys were just talking about, which is AI is increasingly everywhere. Yet we see very little evidence that we are educating people about the technology. Yeah. So what do you think the population needs to understand? Well, I would, I would say that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's very important to understand that, uh, uh, that, that artificial intelligence you know, follows a very long line of, uh, of the human uh, endeavor to imagine that we can create something that is alive. Uh, and that, uh, that so far that's never happened, and, that's, that's, uh, uh, and, and it may be uh, quite a long time uh, to, to never that, that it would happen. It, it, the machine is not opening its eyes and, and, and waking up, um, but, but a, a, a convincing imitation of life yeah. sometimes. But it's uh, like the Mechanical Turk, um, the real, uh, so, so the, 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 the real human part of that, of that chatbot that you're texting with, 
is when it goes off the rails and it's handed over to an actual human. And then the conversation kind of picks up a little bit and they ask you about the weather and, and you know, it becomes a little more human. Chatbots that's, that's ask you about the weather human. too. You know, that's a real human. Yeah, chatbots ask you about the weather. They, Oh, they, they do? They, they, talk they about absolutely the do, yeah. They, they, they are okay. being I, I pro sit you know, corrected. Absolutely, yeah. But, but uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's not just AI being everywhere. You know, for centuries, they've grown up with sort of the three R's of literacy. But I think we need to add something about AI or automation more generally. Because if you think of the, the problems that occur, right, the, the ethical, ethical and biases and other problems that occur, it's at, to some extent, we have to exert our rights as consumers, as shareholders in the companies that are producing these problems, as citizens in general. And I, I draw an analogy with things that, you know, we've been able to fix over time, right? Uh, tobacco or consumption of coats that were produced from endangered animals' fur, or many of these other things where over time it's the the backlash from consumers and citizens and, and maybe in some cases shareholders that caused companies to stop doing things what was were just most profitable but do things that were more responsible. So I think many people talk about having a sort of corporate social responsibility on AI as being one of the needs but I think we really have to bring it back to the other side from the business to the to us right and that's I think that's the education that people as a whole need to be more educated about technology, automation, AI, whatever words you might want to put around that. Which brings us to our next question, which is slightly controversial, but don't shoot the messenger. How can AI be trusted with ethical decisions when the coders produce code echoing racial and ideological bigotry unchecked and in service of the political state? Heavy. So well, I would start with what I clearly, just said. Yeah, it clearly uh, can't be trusted. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a question that answers itself there. Yeah. Arguably. Uh, I, 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 I think that that is what we're working on, right? That, that is, in fact, um, uh, it, it, you know, we have a duty. Uh, and enlightened, let's just say, corporate um, uh, leaders, uh, s you know, seek to understand what it means to be responsible digital leaders. And they need to learn what that means and, and how to how to assure it. And yeah, and, and I would push back on that. I mean, they certainly need to, but we need to push them. Mm -hmm. And you know, just like Nike produced shoes that. You know, with child labor, or you know, there's a lot of carpet weaving that occurs because you need nimble fingers with you know children who are eight, ten, or eleven years old. And and when consumers discover that that's what's going on under the hood, when they become aware and educated enough to know that, they're able to reflect their values onto the businesses. And I think that's the issue with AI: that when we interact with computer systems and algorithms and have no idea what's going underneath. If because we cannot get ourselves educated, then we are in no position to stop the companies that take mm. the routes that may lead to these problems. So I, I think it's really incumbent on the population to get more educated and aware, and maybe us as university folks to, to provide that kind of education. Well, in line with that is a question asking, what kind of careers exist in regards to working with AI ethics? Can this be approached from a perspective of law, for example, with a JD degree? Well, that's, a, okay. that's an affirmative. Um, uh, I um, uh, encounter um, uh, legal experts and, and, uh, and law students pretty much every day who are uh, um, engaged in this, there are there are numerous centers that uh, that, that are really focused on it, and I, I believe that there uh, that, that there will be uh, 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 plenty of work to do um, as as we discover, you know, what's coming out of Pandora's box here. Yeah. Um, I think I think the future of work will really involve teams of people who <laughs> know how to build these systems 
but who are working alongside people from law, philosophy, arts, sociology, psychology, who can advise them or work with them collaboratively on how to get the right outcomes. And it's really, even, even for someone who's building, writing code, it's very hard to be working at two levels at the same time. And I think that's why it's important to have uh, this kind of work done in teams that bring in multiple perspectives and are sort of working in tandem with each other across time. Um, that, that really would be the way to produce uh, code and systems that behave more responsibly. And I would say that seeing the number of people in technology uh, coming to this chat um, is, is encouraging because it means that you may be writing code, but you're concerned about the societal implications of what you're doing. In keeping with that, but going a little more broad, can you please speak to how artificial intelligence will impact the future of work, i.e. how it will shape the landscape of employment more generally for us students? Well, I, I, think, I think of artificial intelligence in this context as a kind of automation. And automation has come for our jobs in waves for centuries. Um, that, that's, that's where, you know, the, uh, the, the looms uh, made weaving, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, obsolete. And, um, and so we're, we're in another one of these waves. Um, and there are uh, different tasks now that, that, uh, uh, that, that are new, you know, newly uh, 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 possible to be automated that weren't possible to automate in the past. Um, but that uh, really the, the, the way that it's being shaped is, in a sense is, is it's, it's uh, uh, turning certain tasks from, from you know, potential jobs to not really very uh, uh, you know, open for uh, as, as future jobs for, for, for you. Um, and what I recommend uh, is that you know you learn how to learn and uh, mm -hmm. and and assume that you'll be uh, training as part of your job, no matter what that job is, as it evolves. Yeah, and I wouldn't dare to make a specific prediction about the future, but I think the point is to look back historically at what automation has done to jobs. And every single time we have this fear that this time automation is going to only kill jobs and not produce other jobs. But what has, you know, if you look at the history, every time there is a wave of automation, it does kill a whole lot of jobs. And then it provides uh, either related employment to some of the people who've lost jobs or it produces jobs in absolutely new categories. And that really gets to the point of uh, what people call reskilling or retraining. And I think it's really, really important to keep that in mind. So if you can build skills that enable you to learn new things in the future, that's really the way to remain relevant, to remain employed, to remain productive. Uh, because it's very hard to forecast whether an accountant's job is going to be automated, or the strawberry picker. I was telling Mark about one of my tennis partners who, um, among other things, builds uh, machines that are robots that cut the caps of strawberries. And there are, there's another company that builds machines that pick strawberries from the plants. right? And these are both extremely challenging tasks for machines to do. And obviously, one impact of that is that it, it cuts down the need for labor. It takes jobs away from the people who are picking and cutting and transporting uh, these fruits. And in some cases, they may have other jobs because um, at this point, we dis I think in agriculture, they destroy, lose about 25% of the crop because there isn't enough labor. So there, there might actually still be work for them. Or they might be work in packaging and doing other things with strawberries because now there's so much more production of strawberries, right? Uh, but in many cases, some percentage of them will lose jobs and be forced to find work that requires a different set of skills. And that is, again, historically has happened every single time. So as a national policy, I think it's important to keep in mind methods for retraining, but at the individual level, you know, acquire skills that are more foundational and fundamental and can be reused. 
in different industries. Those skills could be empathy, for instance, because that maybe one service industry gets automated, but then there's another industry where those same skills uh, could be relevant. They could be computing and coding, you know, more technical skills, but uh, that's what, what I would look for. If you want to, to uh, uh, look for areas that, that, that are, uh, uh, in a sense, automation proof, then you really have to go up the chain of what makes humans human. And one of the things that's, that's, that's really uh, uh, central to what makes us human is, is that we, we have these, the, the ability to empathize. We have you know, something called mirror neurons. And when we watch someone having an experience, we have that same experience ourselves. And that's in the, in the primates and in humans, it's, 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 it's unique. And so, yeah, and I think in the U.S. in particular, one opportunity would be simply if you look at demographic patterns and how they're being reshaped. Um, I had the numbers somewhere, but there's the, the number of people who are 65 and older, and similarly, the number of people who are 75 and older will be doubling in the next 10 years. And that will, rec and, and you know, we already know today we spend about 20% of national spending on healthcare. So if you put those two things together, I think you get a sense for where a lot of work is going to be. And that may be, um, some of that may be automation proof. That brings us to another question. And I would like to meet whoever is asking these questions because you, Josh, have an unusually high number who have made it to the top. <laughs> Which Josh. is, do you think that it's ethical to advance the field of machine learning when those advances have a significant chance of suppressing the human rights of billions, I assume maybe in less developed nations. What do you think? Well, let me ask the, the contrapositive. Do, do you think it's a good idea to stop advancing machine learning, um, uh, you know, because we, we think it might have some some effects in in in, uh, uh, in certain ways, and I and I think that that that's a very hard question. I mean, both sides of that are a very hard question. But uh, but I would uh, I would suggest that um, uh, machine learning is uh, in, in this you know uh, in this simple way it's. It's statistical, you know, uh, uh, statistical method that's been in use for thousands of years. You know, you take a, a number of samples and then you predict what the next sample will be, and uh, uh, and and it, in in a sense, it's what we do. It's 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 uh, uh, another part of what makes us human mm -hmm. is that we take in a lot of samples and then we, we draw conclusions. I mean, the, the, the idea of bias, it's actually just a, a, a you know, the, 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 um, the other side of a particular coin that makes it possible for us to draw conclusions about things with limited amount of information. And, uh, and so the, the fact that we have this tool that, that takes what, you know, what, what, what we do and, uh, and multiplies it, I, I think uh, it's, it's uh, it, I, I would say it's very hard to, 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 to put that back in the box. So, you know, I, I think at some level if the question is about should we throttle ourselves in some way, mm. not do things that we could do, right? We certainly make those choices in many areas. So if you think of human cloning or animal cloning, we make choices not to do certain things even though we are capable of doing them. If you think about mining or drilling in you know, certain regions, we choose to forego those gains, even though we could. Mm. Um, so I think with AI, I think there is a similar need to identify certain things where we might want to throttle ourselves as a society and have some global agreement on those kinds of issues. The problem, I think the challenge with AI, unlike many of these other examples is that execution and progress in those other areas occurred over substantially long periods of time. 
And with AI now, things can move so rapidly that we as societies and governments don't really have the time to assimilate those changes and identify what are the things that we want to be able to do and what are the things where we want to throttle ourselves. And so people have to move at, at a really uh, high speed, I think, to come up with the right kinds of policies and regulations. You know, for a little light reading before bed, if you're having trouble sleeping, you can look up this, this report um, uh, on, on uh, a malicious use of artificial intelligence. The report is called Malicious Use of Artificial Intelligence. And, um, uh, and it's essentially you know, a group of, of sophisticated AI researchers and, and, um, uh, and, and people who care about the topic imagining all the ways in which things uh, could, be, um, uh, could be used and uh, uh, the ways in which AI could be used uh, for, for uh, um, you know, uh, harm. And then what we can do, you know, and we, how to think about what we can do to uh, to to you know minimize that. And that that's that, you know that's a very responsible um, uh, approach. And I think that's that's what I spend a good bit of my time thinking about. Can we solve some of these problems with AI? So, for instance, today you know we, a lot of people talk about deep fake, right? Mm. Could deep fake be prevented with AI? Are we at a point where well, that in particular, right. um, uh, the, the idea of a, a forgery uh, on steroids, which is what deep fake is, and you know, you can make a copy of a signature, you can make a copy of a document. Now you can insert a person's video. face in a video and, and and create what looks like an original video of a person to, in a situation where they never were. Um, the, so, so that uh, is a bit of an arms race, and the the, mm -hmm. the problem is the, that the cost of doing that has plummeted, right? That was possible 50 years ago, but you'd have to edit every frame very carefully and then put it all together and you make right. this fake. Right. And, and so what's changed is that it's now an app. There's an app and it's you know, free or uh, uh, very close to. It's, so the, the, on the other side, you, you have uh, software that detects fakes and, and uh, it's, it's really just a race. I think it's something also that, uh, you know, training uh, and understanding that that's, that's a possibility, that, mm -hmm. that, that's essential. Artificial intelligence being used to solve problems created by artificial intelligence. It's yes. very meta. <laughs> and another question is, seriously, that's, that's actually... That's right. <laughs> Beyond principles, what social infrastructures are needed to prepare us for some of these unintended consequences? What role might precautionary principle play in this domain? Well, I see the, the principles being discussed and discussed by, by, by AI researchers who care um, and, uh, and their uh, th there is work on on essentially putting putting to work these principles in foundations of a kind of new AI right? that 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 is essentially guaranteed to be safe, um, and so that's that's one way in which they, they they can be converted. They can actually go into the foundations of AI, but the the um, the, the, the current stage is that. You know, Europe will be uh, releasing policy and uh, and essentially law uh, governing AI in in sectors, and then I think the part of that is sector by sector, and part of it is uh, uh, you know general code that um, that applies to, for example, to, to, to uh, the the use and protection of data in all sectors, mm -hmm. but uh, then sector by sector, and and those laws will be announced in March. So, so there's there's the law, and uh, and and, um, and and you know working at the level of technology, um, and uh, right education. Yeah, I agree. And do you two think that the rise of machine learning would have even happened 
if it weren't for collecting data from the public without their consent and making money from it? Ooh. I like that question. Yeah, that's actually not quite a, even a binary question, though, to say that anything that was not collected with consent implies that it was collected without consent, right? Because so much of what is out there publicly was, I don't, I don't think you can really claim that so much, much of data that machines are using was necessarily collected without consent. But I think if, it, if, if, you, if you somehow limited what data might have been used in the last 20 years by AI systems, that would simply delay the whole thing by a few years. I don't think it would change anything fundamentally. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think the internet uh, gave us free services, and uh, we, we didn't understand 20 years ago when it was possible to look at the yellow pages and get a map and all of these things that just started becoming possible, right? That get, get news and all on one screen without getting up from your seat. That, that we, we didn't think that our selections and choices were being archived and that, that, that and, and ultimately it would turn into uh, a machine that could predict what we want to buy next, you know? And, and so it was really a lack of understanding and not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't feel to me like that was collected without our consent. It was just that it collected without anyone really understanding what was coming. And this question is more of the yes or no form, but do you think that the European Union's five-year moratorium on facial recognition technology should be adopted in this country? Across the board on, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that actually, but I think that's going back to my point about identifying certain things that we choose to throttle. Uh, because facial recognition can have so many different right. applications, and many of them will be good applications. I think in healthcare and aging populations, that's going to be absolutely useful in, in using AI to detect various types of incidents or events that occur. So I, I don't think it would be a good idea to somehow ban it across the board. In law enforcement, and, and uh, that's a good you know, good proposal. I might say yes to that. I'm not sure. If you have a benevolent government. Yeah. It's looking like we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Um, one of them that's very much in line with what you were just saying is, do you believe there should be legal regulations to limit the future of AI? And if so, what kinds of legal regulations? I think there have to be, I cannot, don't know if I can answer the what kind question, but there certainly needs need to be some legal regulations, but we first have to develop enough understanding to define what they are. And, you know, again, thinking of other examples, you know, how we use nuclear technologies, we have uh, rules around that, how we use chemical and radioactive tools. Um, I, so with every such technology, you can produce great things and you can produce great harm, but you've got to understand the harmful possibilities. They're becoming aware in the last several years. Um, and if there are, I, I think our policymaking body should be thinking about this issue. I have one particular area that I feel strongly about uh, that should be banned, and that is autonomous weapons. Autonomous lethal mm -hmm. weapons uh, are, are, again, plummeting in price. It's, it's now possible to make something that is, you know, a, a drone with a face recognizer with a bullet, right? That's, right. that's uh, there's a, 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 a horrifying YouTube video that was released by the Future of Life Institute called um, Slaughterbots. And if you want to be scared, you can watch this. It takes five minutes and then you won't want to have dinner. So. I, I, uh, but I, I believe that, that even with a ban, a, a ban is a start, but even with a ban, you know, we just, we, we, we are in a situation where something extremely powerful is so cheap that it's very hard to know yeah. where it's being developed. And uh, 
uh, we're, yeah, we're in a time I, of peril. I think your point about the arms race is absolutely the apt way to describe this. So you might develop missiles and then missile interceptors. And mm -hmm. those drones will happen whether they are banned or not. Yeah. And we will need to have things that can prevent them from doing harm. And it's an arms race. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what do you think are some of the obstacles that currently stand in the way of AI breakthroughs? Well, I think one obstacle is a business opportunity that uh, we are at a point where we have enough technologies that have not yet been applied and deployed in hundreds of domains. So obviously, if applications create value, there will be a lot of people and money chasing around doing that kind of work, and less talent going towards making fundamental breakthroughs that may have thousands of other applications. Um, I would put that as number one, because if you think of the obstacles, historically, obstacles to AI, computing power, data, and so forth, those have been met. Um, we have certain types of logic and reasoning. We are not going to invent new types. We might discover how to make machines do temporal reasoning and other kinds of things. But um, I think it's really, right now, the calling need is for making useful applications of AI using the technologies that we've developed over the last few years. To say it in a different way, we are training the next generation of, of, of AI researchers who are going to discover these, these breakthroughs. And their first year in graduate school, they have a stack of job offers, generally five, right? Facebook, uh, Google, Apple, and so on. And, and so uh, uh, it, it, there, there's just this siren song uh, of applied AI mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, that is a drain f from the, the actual research, you know, the deep research. Now, there are research labs inside the big digital companies, but they have the siren song of making money, and they're, 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 you, know, you can't deny that there's, yeah. there's some effect on, on, on that. But it, it's possible that a major breakthrough will come from one of the big labs. If... And the final question that I'll ask is, Artificial intelligence is evolving so quickly. How do non-technical people keep up? I, I don't want to sound, you know, let them eat cake, but I, but I actually believe that uh, there is so much written about it uh, that, that, that is hype, and it doesn't take much actually to, to, to cut through it and, and, and try to understand what's really going on. And then once you get a grip on that, to keep track of what's, what's really uh, being developed. So I, I, I would say um, there, there, are, um, you know, there, are, there are some pretty straightforward um, um, texts for the general public on AI. And then, um, um, you, you know, you could read uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 say Scientific American or something, and just keep track. Yeah. And it's not, it's not yeah. that. I, I, of course, I have a PhD in the field, and so maybe I shouldn't be talking. Yeah, but more generally, I'd say there are two ways to learn or educate yourself. One is to, um, it's a few people manage to do and discover the meaning of life by sitting under a tree for 20 years. But most of us need to look for external inputs and stimulants from books, magazines, articles, newspapers. And I think the real challenge to that is we have AI systems prevent, uh, preventing us from doing that by pushing us more and more recommendations to watch the next movie or read the next post. But really, I think it requires making deliberate choices to invest your time to use it productively to learn new things. And they don't have to be very technical books or manuals or coding, but really to, to pick out uh, popular uh, articles and uh, sources, but read about uh, these, these ideas and these tools. 
Well, we have a, sh a few very short announcements, but before we get to that, uh, can we please get a big round of applause for our two speakers? Do you want me to press next? Oh. There you go. Forward. Forward. There we there. go. There. So now it's time for the results of the raffle. Shake it up. Shake it up. That's right. Ah. I thought I was going to do that. I've never picked out a raffle ticket. Do you want to pick it? Yes, please. You can pick it. Do I get to read it too, or does Mark get to read it? All right. Oh dear. All right, so we have Samantha Montefer. Samantha. She left. My luck. Do you, do you have to be here for the prize? I say we've never encountered this problem before, but. Uh, you snooze, you well, lose, that sort of thing. Their, do you have a phone number? Do you have their phone number? Are you a friend? She left. Can you give it to her? What? Let's just pull one. Let's pull another. Oh. I'm, I'm choosing very carefully. Ah. Jessica Sanchez. O for two. Oh, Jessica. All right, and before everyone heads out, uh, please, if you have the time, fill out a brief survey at slido.com. Uh, same code, F-O-W-U-C-D. Uh, it's quite short, but it would really help us out with uh, planning and organizing our upcoming events, of which we have two this quarter. The first of which is on February 20th, and it will be about the cannabis industry. Yes, you heard that right, cannabis. <laughs> and the third will be a talk on the future of media, and it will be featuring the founder and former president of Fox Studios. Not Fox News, Fox Television Studios, Mountain in the Middle. So, stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs>